We're going to bring to a close today, I promise, our current series on the power of Christ's death and resurrection. And today, we want to examine the three post-resurrection appearances of Jesus Christ, as recorded in John chapter 20, followed by our Lord's clear, great commission instructions to his disciples and church, ending with the ascension of Jesus Christ and his prediction that you shall be witnesses to me. And dear friends, these amazing truths which we'll study today are designed to either bring you to faith in the Son of God who loved you and gave himself for you, if you are yet unsaved, or to strengthen your faith in the Word of God if you are a doubting or unestablished believer, or to motivate your witness for Jesus Christ, as this is what his love compels us to proclaim as ambassadors for Jesus Christ. And I firmly believe, based upon the Word of God, that the gospel of Jesus Christ has the power to forever change a person's eternal destiny and then to change a person's life and purpose all by God's grace. So let me invite you to open your Bibles with me to the book of John, chapter 20. John, chapter 20. As we've been studying verse by verse through John chapters 18, 19, and 20, it's been a very rich study in which we have observed Jesus' trial before Pilate, followed by a close examination of Jesus' crucifixion on Golgotha, which resulted in Jesus' burial by Joseph and Nicodemus. But since death and grave could not hold our Lord Jesus Christ, we began to examine last time Jesus' bodily resurrection and post-resurrection appearances. And in doing so, we underscored, first of all, the importance and priority of Jesus Christ's resurrection, both doctrinally and practically. And then to demonstrate that our faith in Jesus Christ and the gospel is not based on some fiction or fairy tale. We considered seven proofs of Jesus Christ's resurrection. And it is an impressive composite of evidence that shows that Jesus Christ truly rose from the dead. These proofs involve such evidence as the great earthquake, which accompanied this event just like at Christ's death, followed by the large stone being rolled back out of its track. And it's a very huge stone. Some have projected four to five hundred pounds, rolled up an incline, and is found to be out of its track, requiring a tremendous display of strength or power. A third proof of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is that the Roman seal is broken, with the consequences of breaking the Roman seal being automatic execution by crucifixion upside down. And this indicates that a supernatural power was involved, not a collective weakness of a group of believing women or a group of fearful disciples who somehow stole the body away. But when the angel rolled back the stone, the seal would have been broken. A fourth proof of the resurrection is the fear and eventual flight of the soldiers in which these soldiers risked their very lives, in abandoning their assigned post and fleeing the scene. And why did they do this? It is because they were very afraid as they experienced and saw something they had never nor ever will see again. An earthquake and an angel who rolled the stone back out of its track, breaking the Roman seal. And thus, the fifth proof of the resurrection of Jesus Christ was the announcement of the angel to the women that he is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that for the second time, he is risen from the dead, and indeed he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. 
Behold, I have told you. And this is, the really, this is really the only viable explanation for the earthquake followed by the stone being rolled back with the Roman seal broken and the Roman soldiers being fearful and having fled. Why? For he is risen. And by the way, again, the open door was not to let Jesus out, but to let others in to see this for themselves. And thus, proof number six was the first-hand observation of the open tomb by the women, which resulted in fear and great joy as they ran to bring Christ's disciples' word of the resurrection. But were the women or the disciples faithfully waiting for Jesus to rise from the dead? And the answer is, is no. Instead, they went to the tomb to perfume what they assumed would be the putrefying body of the Lord Jesus Christ. But when they saw the resurrected Christ, they clung to him and they worshipped him, and he received their worship as God. And Jesus told them to go and tell his disciples that he is risen, just as he said. And by the way, did the Jewish authorities ever really deny The reality of the empty tomb, and the answer is is no. Instead, they bribe the Roman soldiers to lie and say the body was stolen. They never denied the empty tomb. Why? For the evidence was overwhelming and undeniable. So instead, they propagated this lie among the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And thus, the seventh proof of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ was the first-hand observation of the empty tomb by Peter and John, which involved their observing the orderly scene of the undisturbed linen cloths and separated but neatly folded handkerchief. And this is where we left off last time, so let's pick it up again in John chapter 20, and we begin in verse 1. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, namely John, and said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Notice we, the other ladies, the women were with Mary initially. You see, Mary Magdalene wasn't expecting Jesus Christ to be raised from the dead either. And that's why she is another impressive witness to these facts. In fact, she assumed the empty tomb meant that the Jewish leaders or the Roman soldiers had stolen our Lord's body. And to her, the empty tomb was due to natural causes, not a supernatural resurrection. So what did Peter and John do upon hearing this? Verse 3, Peter therefore went out, and the other disciple were going to the tomb. So they both ran together, and as I pointed out last week, humorously we read, and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first, who, by the way, was John who was writing this. And he, stooping down and looking in, into what? The empty tomb, but not going in, Cautious, careful, he saw the linen cloths which, it, which had wrap, been wrapped around the body of the Lord Jesus in his burial, lying there. Yet he did not go in. But then Peter arrives on the scene, probably panting, a little behind John. And What do we read? Verse 6, And Simon Peter came following him, went into the tomb, and he saw the linen cloth lying there and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloth, but folded together in a place by itself. And again, unlike the resurrection of Lazarus in John chapter 11, who needed help getting out of his grave clothes after his resurrection, Jesus' glorified body simply passed through the linen wrappings. And as I mentioned last time, grave robbers would have either ripped the linen cloths off the body or, more likely, kept them on the body to keep the body together in a move. In fact, grave robbers normally wouldn't have taken a body, period. 
They would have taken any treasures they found in the tomb. But why carry around a putrefying body? And then the handkerchief was folded separately to show that Jesus was alive and he folded it nicely. Again, giving proof of the resurrection. So what did this result in? Verse 8, then the other disciple, namely John, who came to the tomb first, third time he mentions that, went in also. And what did he do? He saw and he believed. Now, John was already a believer. He was already saved by the grace of God. He already had eternal life. But he believed, what? That Jesus truly rose from the dead. For as yet, they did not know, they did not grasp, they did not really take to heart the Scripture that he must, of necessity, rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away to their own homes, fully convinced, of Jesus Christ's resurrection from the dead. Now, consider with me, dear saints, and even any searching unbelievers who might be listening, the incredible and irrefutable proofs of Jesus Christ's resurrection. There was the great earthquake. There was the stone rolled back and out of its track. There was the seal broken, the Roman guards fear and flight, the announcement of the angel. He is risen, just as he said. There was the cover-up by the Jewish leaders, and the lack of denial of an empty tomb. There was the first-hand observation of the women, and then there was the first-hand observation of these men, none of which expected Jesus Christ to rise from the dead. And thus there are literally mountains of evidence to cause you to believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. But there's still more evidence to consider as we now examine the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus Christ. And there really are too many to consider with our remaining time today. You can see a number of them that are mentioned in kind of the place they fit chronologically. In fact, if you add it all up, there are over 515 15 witnesses on no less than 10 different occasions in which individuals and groups saw Jesus Christ alive after his resurrection from the grave. In fact, I started to do the math this morning. Can you imagine you were in a courtroom and you had 515 witnesses and you gave them 15 minutes each to testify what did they see and you add that all up and you have over 128 hours of testimony of individuals who claim they saw the risen Christ. 128 hours. Next. He's alive. Next. He rose from the grave. Next. I saw him. Next. You know. Overwhelming evidence. But for our purposes today, let's consider just three post-resurrection appearances of Jesus Christ. The first one is to a woman named Mary Magdalene. We begin in verse 11. But Mary, Mary Magdalene, stood outside by the tomb weeping. And she wept. And she stooped down and she looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus lay. Then he said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Notice the emphasis here. And Mary's sorrow in light of Jesus' death. There's some constant, unrestrained weeping. And the angel here gently says to her, in essence, there's nothing really to cry about, woman. Why are you weeping? And she said to him, verse 13, because they have taken away, notice, my Lord. My Lord. And I do not know where they have laid him. Now, is she thinking he rose from the dead? No. She's thinking someone took him away. And she has tears. You know, sometimes our tears are clearly justified. Other times there are tears of ignorance or tears of unbelief. And sometimes people re 
refuse to be comforted when the promises of God and the presence of God could comfort them in their loss. So Mary, because she does not grasp the reality of the situation, has ongoing weeping. Verse 14. Now when she had said this, she turned around and she saw Jesus standing there and did not know or recognize that it was Jesus. Mary doesn't recognize Jesus at first. Well, why? Well, may I suggest that perhaps it's because she had been crying, not looking. Or perhaps it's because she was not expecting him. Or perhaps it could be there was some characteristics about his new glorified body. Remember the last time she saw Jesus, what did he look like? A beaten, battered, scourged, crucified body. And all of that would have been gone except the nail prints in his hands and feet. Verse 15. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Oh, sure, Mary, you're going to lift that body. But don't you love her loving devotion? <laughs> oh, I'll take care of the body. I'll take him away. Verse 16, and Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him, Roboni, which is to say, teacher. Notice, what triggered her understanding of who she was speaking to? It was hearing her voice spoken, hearing her name spoken by Jesus Christ, saying, Mary. Probably in Aramaic, like he always had. And how does Mary respond? Rabboni, which means teacher, but it's an intensive form of rabbi. It's used occasionally in reference to men. It's used normally in reference to God. And what does Mary then do upon recognizing him? Verse 17, Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me. Now, the word literally means stop clinging to me. I mean, she saw Jesus, and what she do? Just like the other one, she just clomps on to probably his legs or ankles somewhere there and says in essence, I'm not letting you go. She clings to him. Do not cling to me. Why? For I have not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brother, brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father and to my God and your God. So notice, he says to her, stop clinging to me. For Mary doesn't want to let him go. Now, have you ever felt that way with someone you love and you miss? Especially at an anticipated time of separation. They're going off to war. Maybe they're about to die. And she says, I, I'm not letting you go. And Jesus had a number of things yet to fulfill, including his ascension. So he told her, Mary, stop clinging to me. And instead, what I want you to do is I want you to go and I want you to tell my disciples that you've seen the Lord, the risen Christ, and that he's spoken these things to her. And you know what? That's exactly what she did. And here's another eyewitness testimony of the risen Lord, not because of merely seeing an empty tomb, but actually of seeing a resurrected Christ. But what does this appearance by Jesus to Mary show us about him? You know, while Mary may have seemed insignificant to the teeming crowd of people in Jerusalem for the Passover, she wasn't insignificant to Jesus Christ. And neither are you. You know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Christ, in essence, was thinking of you on the cross. He wanted to save you from a hell you deserve to a heaven you don't. He rose again and he wants to give you eternal life. And now that you're saved, he wants to minister to you where you are at. Will you let him? Will you trust him? 
Will you let him comfort you? And that's exactly what he does to someone who would be cast off, insignificant. But you're not insignificant. You're not a just another number. The Lord loves you and he cares about you personally. And so we see this post-resurrection appearance of our Lord to Mary. But it doesn't stop there. For Jesus Christ also appeared to the ten disciples. For Judas was already dead and Thomas, in this case, was absent. As they were hiding behind closed doors for fear of the Jews. And he walked through the doors and he said to them, Peace be with you. And then showed them his hands and his side. We see this beginning in verse 19. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, which is Sunday, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled, why? For fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood in the midst. When the doors were shut, he walked right through the door, stands right in the midst of them, and said to them, Peace be with you. So there were locked doors. Jesus walks through them in his glorified body. He calms them, for they had thought he had, they had seen a ghost. Verse 20, and when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. He gave them, as it were, empirical evidence to, for them to truly see it was the Lord Jesus Christ. It was not a ghost, for a, a ghost... A spirit hath not flesh and bones. Verse 20, Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. They were glad. Verse 21, And Jesus said to them, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. Now notice here closely the last sentence of that verse. As the Father has sent me as his representative on a mission, I also send you on a mission. Jesus Christ was sent by the Father into the world, and we are sent by Jesus Christ into the world in order to fulfill a mission, to be an ambassador for Jesus Christ. And what a great purpose in life. Not to fill space, not to retire, not to make a million. We have an eternal purpose, a godly purpose, a significant purpose to be an ambassador for Jesus Christ, representing our Lord and Savior on foreign turf, being a witness of the gospel for Christ by your lip and by your life. And dear friends, there's only so much time. Don't waste it, but redeem it. Don't be a stumbling block to others, but a stepping stone to Christ. And let the Lord use you in your sphere of influence in the personal context that you have. For you are an ambassador on foreign turf. You're just a pilgrim and a stranger passing through. And one day you're going home, but you're not there yet. And God has a purpose and a mission for you. In fact, this is John's version, as it were, of the great commission of our Lord. And according to Mark's account of the great commission, what were they to do on this Christ-sent mission? As the Father has sent me, I am sending you to do what? To go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature or to all creation. And the gospel, again, is that Christ died for your sins, according to the Scriptures. The proof is he was buried on the third day. He rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And because of what Christ did on your behalf at Calvary, salvation is available to you as a free gift received through simple childlike faith in the person and work of Christ. And we're to go to all the creation, not just the Jews like the gospel of the kingdom, but to all the world. Why? Because Christ died for all. And God wants all to be saved. And he wants to use us to communicate that message. 
Now to carry out this God-given mission to preach the gospel, these disciples knew they were totally inadequate. In fact, they were hiding behind closed doors for fear of the temple guards when Jesus Christ gave them these marching orders. Thus, to accomplish this mission, they would need supernatural power. So what then did Jesus Christ symbolically do? Verse 22. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Now, it's interesting for the word breathed, the word breath is the word pneuma, and the word spirit is the word pneuma, and thus he is symbolically communicating, from my mouth I will send you, as it were, the Holy Spirit to enable you to fulfill this mission. Now, he's not like Benny Hinn, slaying them in the spirit. And they didn't fall down either, by the way. And by the way, that's not found in the Bible anywhere. That kind of stuff is pure showmanship. It's a charlatan. It's a, it's a scam. It's not biblical. Check it out with the Word of God. But what he does do here is he seeks to show them what their power source will be in order to fulfill this mission. Now, was this actual or symbolic? Did they receive the Holy Spirit that day? And I believe the answer is no. Why? Because several days later, before Jesus Christ ascended into heaven, he tells these same disciples, you will receive power. Will receive is in the future tense. That means they didn't have it already. When would they receive it? When the Holy Spirit comes on you, which means he hadn't already. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when did this historically happen or when was this fulfilled? Well, on the day of Pentecost. When the, Jesus Christ sent the Holy Spirit and he descended upon this gathered group of believers. And what then happened? That very man, Peter, who had denied Jesus Christ three times on the night before his crucifixion, stands before the crowd gathered at this Jewish feast, and he preaches with Holy Spirit boldness the gospel of Jesus Christ, and what did it result in? 3,000 souls were saved. And how do you explain that? Number one, he had seen the risen Christ. And number two, he's now given supernatural power through the Holy Spirit. So what does Jesus Christ then say to these ten disciples? And what does it mean? Verse 23, a verse that oftentimes is misunderstood. He says, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now, if you notice closely, the words forgive and retain are in juxtaposition. They are in contrast. They are opposites. Just like forgiven and retained are opposites. Now, something that will help you understand this is that the word forgiven and retained is in the perfect tense. The idea here, in fact, it's a perfect passive indicative in the Greek. The idea is, if you forgive the sins of any, they have been already forgiven and remain that way. Now, what does this mean since only God can forgive sins? Is he saying that these disciples were able to forgive sins? Well, no. What he's saying is this, that in preaching the gospel, when someone believes in Jesus Christ, based upon the word of God, you can tell the person, your sins are forgiven. Why? Because God has forgiven them the moment they believed in Christ. You can assure them of that reality. And if they say, no, I don't believe that, you can say, well, your sins are retained. You're not forgiven. Why? Because God already said they're not forgiven. 
Because no person has the right to forgive or the ability or authority to forgive sins from God. That's why whenever a Roman Catholic priest or a Lutheran pastor or whatever at the end of a service says, with the authority vested in me by God, I now absolve you from all your sins. I want to yell out, who gave you that authority? Nobody. Only God can forgive sins. So that's exactly what Peter did, what I just explained with Cornelius and his household in Acts chapter 10. What did he say? Of him all the prophets bear witness that through his name, everyone who believes in him receives remission or forgiveness of sins. Peter is preaching the forgiveness of sins comes how? Through Jesus Christ. And if you believe in him, you'll be forgiven. And if you don't believe in him, you won't be forgiven. So believers can declare a sinner forgiven or unforgiven depending upon their acceptance or rejection of the gospel. In fact, you know, just two weeks ago I had an opportunity to lead a girl to the Lord and as she got saved, I said to her, do you know what this means? This means tonight you were saved. This means tonight you were forgiven. Tonight you were born again. Now, I'm just simply telling her what God told her based upon the authority of the Word of God. I didn't forgive her. I didn't cause her to be born again. And I didn't save her. I just gave her the message. She believed it. And I assured her of what God said. That's exactly what our Lord is doing here. Unfortunately, the Roman Catholic system with its unscriptural Nicolaity arrangement of clergy and the laity has totally perverted and twisted these verses out of its historical, scriptural, and doctrinal context to falsely teach apostolic succession. And that the apostles' so-called authority to forgive sins, which they never had, has been passed down to their present church leadership. No way, Jose. Only God can forgive sins. In fact, do you know there is no New Testament record of any apostle ever absolving anyone from their sins? Why? Because they understood what Jesus said here. They were to preach the gospel. Someone believed it. They could say, you're forgiven. They say, I don't believe that. I'm still trusting my works. Okay, you're not forgiven. And so these ten disciples came face to face and heard and saw and touched the risen Christ. And by the way, what later incredible proof that these disciples had seen the risen Christ? It was their boldness to preach the gospel, and their willingness to even die in serving Jesus Christ after denying or forsaking him at the cross out of fear of the Jews. Before they're shaking in their boots with locked doors, don't find me. After they saw the risen Christ and the Spirit of God came, there they are preaching, and they're willing to lay down their lives. In fact, tradition tells us this is what happened to the various apostles and one after another was martyred. Why? Because they were witnesses to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now we observe our, our third post-resurrection appearance of Jesus Christ as he later appeared to the 11 disciples. As John was now present and Jesus provided for him empirical proof of his resurrected, glorified body, which Thomas had demanded. Now, remember, earlier there were only ten disciples present who was missing Thomas, doubting Thomas. So we pick it up in verse 24. Now, Thomas called the twin, one of the twelve, the name for the apostolic group, was not with them when Jesus came. And the other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. So he said to them, Unless I see his hands and the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And by the way, the word not there is ume. 
I'll never believe that. Verse 26, and after eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them this time. And Jesus came, and the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here and look at my hands. Reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, apistos, but believing, pistos. Do not continue in your unbelief, doubting Thomas. Start believing, I rose from the dead. And Jesus Christ, by the way, is saying the same thing to you today if you are a doubting believer. Stop being unbelieving, but start being believing. Your doubts are not to be cherished, nor are they acceptable to the Lord, for without faith it's impossible to please him. Isn't it amazing that Jesus Christ would appear to this same group of disciples again to encourage the unbelief of one of his disciples? And how did Thomas respond to seeing and hearing the risen Savior? Verse 28, Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. This is probably the greatest confession of any apostle. Probably rivaling Peter's in Matthew 16 when he said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Notice, my Lord... And my God, the emphasis is on deity. And the proof that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, was his death and ultimate resurrection from the grave. By the way, do you know how Jehovah Witnesses answer this verse as they deny his deity? They say Thomas said something like, oh my Lord, oh my God. Flippantly, irreverently, inappropriately. Thomas' statement is absolutely one of reverence and respect. Jesus Christ is Lord and God. He is deity. And he's not only Lord and God. He is my Lord and he is my God. Personally. My. So what does this indicate about the person of Jesus Christ? That he is God who became a man. As only a man could die for our sins and be raised from the dead. To provide for us a free and forever salvation. And what does all of this mean to those who have not seen the risen Christ like Thomas? Verse 29. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed or blessed are those who have not seen and yet... Who have believed. And by the way, that is the real issue. The issue is one of belief. How about you? You know, it's one thing to believe that Jesus Christ is God, but is he your God? It's one thing to believe that Jesus Christ died for the sins of the world and rose again, but do you believe that he did it for you? If you have believed based upon the scriptures, you are blessed. For blessed are those who haven't seen and yet have believed. And you may not have been there, but based upon the word of God and the overwhelming evidence God has given to you in his word, in order to believe, you are blessed when you believe. Now what is important to note about the placing of this statement in the book of John is previously he's had the seven signs. Previously he's had the I am's. Previously, he has given the upper room discourse in John 13 through 17. And then Pilate's trial in 18. And his crucifixion and burial in 19. And the greatest sign is resurrection from the dead in chapter 20. And Thomas' climactic statement now is recorded for us by John. Who is this Christ? Who is this Jesus? He is my Lord and my God. And why were all these things written? Verse 30. And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. Why aren't they written in this book? Because it's not necessary. Why not? 
Because there is enough evidence compiled here for you to have no reason not to believe the gospel. So why are these written in this book? But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. And if you're here today and you've never been saved, at this point, your problem is not due to a lack of solid scriptural evidence, but of stubborn unbelief if you're unwilling to trust in Christ. You see, these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And as the Son of God, He is God who became a man. He's the one who died for your sins. He's the one who rose again. And that believing, and that's the only condition. You may have life in his name. And again, his name represents who he is and what he has done. And that's why verse after verse after verse in the book of John emphasizes believing. To as many as received him... To them he gave the right to become the sons of God, even to them that believe in his name, John 1, 12. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life, John 3, 16. Most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my voice and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but has passed from death unto life, John 5, 24. And that is why believers, when we preach the gospel, let's get it right. We are emphasizing a person, Jesus Christ, not a church and not a religion. We're emphasizing his work, that he died and he rose again. And when he died, he paid for our sins. And when he rose again, he offers to us eternal life and it's a free gift. And the only condition to receive it is simply to believe. And the result is you have life. And in the book of John, that life is eternal life, which by its very definition can never be lost and goes on forever. And this is what people need to hear. And that is why as we look at the pre-ascension instructions of Jesus Christ, go with me, if you would, to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. Have you ever asked yourself, well, after Jesus rose from the dead and before he ascended into heaven, what did he do? Well, he showed himself to various people, but he gave some very specific instructions. These instructions are oftentimes called the Great Commission and were given between Christ's resurrection and his ascension. In view of his teaching in the upper room discourse of John 13 through 17 and his intent on building the church, which he had promised. Now keep in mind the historical timing of this. It's after his death and resurrection, but it's before his ascension. And it's right before the beginning of the church. And keep in mind the chronology of this. He's preached in the upper room He shared that he's going to die, he's going to be raised from the dead, he's going to ascend into heaven, he's going to send to them the Holy Spirit, and here are the instructions you need, and you have to keep that in mind when you read these passages. Because they set the table in the context for these truths. Now these instructions were given by our Lord to the disciples to be carried out by the church after the descent of the Holy Spirit. And they're found in five passages. Now we've already seen one of them in John 20, 21 through 23. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. To do what? To preach the gospel. And when people believe, you can say you're forgiven. They don't believe, say you're not forgiven. But in Matthew chapter 28, we see another passage related to this. We begin in verse 16. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. By the way, 
Worshiping him indicates he's who? He's God, because who alone are you to worship? God, and Jesus doesn't censor them for doing this. But some doubted, and Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And therefore, what I'm going to tell you carries with it apostolic, I mean, excuse me, divine authority. Sometimes people say, well, what authority do you have to come over here and and give people the gospel? Or to go to these these people in other countries and, and upset their culture, as it were. And while it is true, there are certain cultural things we need not upset. Oftentimes, cultural things are based upon religious superstitions and beliefs that the gospel eventually knocks over. And the authority we have is the authority in which Jesus Christ, who's been given all authority, has told us about this. Verse 19, what, are we, what were they to do? Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. And by the way, that is the primary instruction. To make disciples of all the nations. And making the disciples involves more than leading them to Christ, so it involves that. The purpose of the going is to preach the gospel. And thus, evangelism is integral to this. It starts with evangelism, but it doesn't stop there. And so there's to be this going to preach the gospel. There is to be baptizing as a means of public testimony and identification of believers in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And there is to be this teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. But keep that in mind. That has in view, again, John 13 through 17, not everything Jesus previously taught. And what promise is connected with this? And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. By the way, if the Great Commission wasn't for the entirety of the age, why would Christ promise? Promise to be with them to the end of the age. And so these are the instructions. And by the way, this is not unique to the original apostles. For the apostle Paul also chimes in and says in Romans 1 verse 5, Through Jesus Christ we have received grace and apostleship. For what? For obedience to the faith. Literally the obedience of the faith. Among all nations, same term, ethnos. All people groups. Why? For his name, that's why. Unfortunately, the Great Commission is too often the great omission. And by the way, more and more so in our day. But I love what C.J. Pace drew and wrote almost 100 years ago. They have the presence who travel the road. Because what did the Lord say? And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And so when we go, we go with a sense the Lord is with us, the Spirit of God is in us, the power is available, the message is powerful, and I need, by the grace of God, out of the love of Christ compelling me, to preach the gospel and teach them the word of God. And by the way, the need has not changed. The commission has not changed. The gospel has not changed. The harvest is white, but again, the laborers are few. And we're to pray, and we're to go, and we're to disciple. But go with me now to Mark chapter 16. As each of these recorded comments on the Great Commission shed further light on them, In Mark 16, verse 14, later he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table and he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. By the way, the word rebuke means to sharply rebuke. He chewed them out. You know, some people have the impression Jesus Christ, you know, wouldn't wouldn't hurt a flea, you know. He chewed them out. He rebuked them. I told you I was going to rise from the dead. Why didn't you believe me? And if the Lord was talking to us today, how often would he be chewing us out for not just believing his word? But what I love is after he chews them out, he doesn't say, and you're done. 
I'm not using you guys again. Forget it. No. Because you see, the fulfillment of these instructions is a grace operation. So what does he do? Verse 15, and he said to them, who's them? Those he just chewed out. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. What message is to be preached? The gospel. Verse 16, he who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Now what does that mean? We know from verse after verse in comparing Scripture with Scripture, there's only one condition to be saved. It's to believe. But the normal byproduct of believing was to be baptized, and this is consistent with Matthew 28. They were to go and disciple and baptize. And the second half of this verse clarifies the verse, the first half, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Notice it doesn't say he who does not believe and is not baptized will be condemned. Because the issue isn't baptism or lack of baptism. The issue is one of believing to be condemned or believing to be saved. But the normal byproduct of that was getting baptized. And by the way, the thief on the cross was never baptized. There are other people who have never been baptized, but they've believed and they've been saved. But what was especially connected with the ministry of the apostles in the early church to authenticate their message and ministry? Verse 17. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents and if they drink anything deadly it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, sick and they will recover. Now keep in mind that this was especially connected with the ministry of the apostles in order to authenticate their message and their ministry. You take up snakes today, I'll get what? They are going to hurt you. And you know, that's why you keep reading occasionally in the paper of some snake handling preacher who gets bit and dies. And you know what they say when it's done? You didn't have enough faith, brother, you know. Oh, yes, I did. That's why I picked that snake up. Problem wasn't a lack of faith. Problem was you didn't rightly divide the word of truth. And by the way, this is exactly what happened in the early church. They cast out demons. They spoke with new tongues. They took up serpents like Paul did in the book of Acts. They laid hands on the six and they recovered. But even it, during the first century, we see the decline of this more and more once the ministry of the apostles was established and the word of God was becoming complete. So what then happened and what did the disciples do? So then after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat at the right hand of God. This is the ascension of our Lord. And notice the comment that follows in Mark now. And they went out and preached everywhere, just like the Lord had said. By the way, who's the they? The disciples, whom he had chewed out, who were products of grace. And notice the comment, and the Lord working with them. But notice, preached is in what tense? Past. And the Lord was working with them and confirming the word how through the accompanying signs. Confirming the word of who? They. Who's they? The apostles. The apostles. Now, last words are important instructions. And Christ now is on the right hand of God, the place of honor and authority. And we see that they, again, follow these instructions and the Lord honored it, and the gospel went out, and people were saved. And what can we take from this? We're to still go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now go with me to Luke chapter 24. And again, the context is the same historically. Verse 44 is where we want to pick it up. Then he, Jesus, said to them, the disciples, 
These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you. That all things must be fulfilled which are written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. By the way, what was the Old Testament all about? It was about Jesus Christ. Verse 45, And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the Scriptures. Then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary, what was necessary? For the Christ, the Messiah, to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And what was now to be preached in connection with this message? And that repentance, a change of mind about Jesus Christ, who died and rose again, and remission of sins, needed to go to heaven, should be preached in his name, to all nations, starting where? Beginning at Jerusalem. Who's going to do that? And you are witnesses of these things. So again, similar kind of message that we read in Matthew and Mark. Now again, repentance doesn't mean sorrow for sin. It means a change of mind about who? Jesus Christ, who suffered and rose from the dead. And what results when you change your mind about Jesus Christ so that you put your faith in him? You get remission of sins. And this is the message that needs to be preached. Who's God going to use? You are the witnesses of these things. And God still wants to use you today. He wants to use you today. And what would God provide for them to accomplish this again? Verse 49, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from an eye. What's the promise of the Father? The Holy Spirit. And he would not only baptize believers into the body of Christ, but he would provide power from on high. And then what happened? Verse 50, He led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and he blessed them. Now it came to pass, while he blessed them, that he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. Imagine, he went through the first heaven, to the second heaven, to the third heaven, to the right hand of the Father. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. And you know, God still wants to use you today. Again, pace Almost 100 years ago, it says this, Look here, son, get that idea out of your head. Why waste your life on a lot of good-for-nothing heathen when your prospects are so bright for a career at home? After he tells his dad, Father, I'm going to be a foreign missionary. And oh, there's a lot of things to discourage us from being a witness. And I'm not saying God wants everyone to be a foreign missionary, but I know this. It's not a matter of you becoming an ambassador for Christ. If you're saved, you are an ambassador. The question is simply, what kind of ambassador are you? And the fact of the matter is, the Lord has opened many doors for us individually and collectively as a church. And he wants to use us to preach the gospel, to teach the word, to disciple all people groups, to do our part, as it were, in the Great Commission. Now, who wrote the book of Luke? Luke, right? That's really deep. I just want to see if you're still with me. Who wrote the book of Acts? Luke. Who did Luke write Luke to? Theophilus. Who did Luke write Acts to? Theophilus. And he says the same kind of things. And we pick it up in Acts 1, verse 6. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said, well, I don't plan to do that in the future at all. In fact, don't you realize that the church has replaced Israel? No, that's not what he says. He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. I'm going to do that in the future, but that is not your concern. What is your concern? That you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. You say, that must include Duluth. No, we're not the end of the earth, but we can see it, can't we? 
We can see it. And what then happened to our Lord and what was promised regarding his return? Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up. And a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as they went up, behold, two men stood by in white apparel. These are angels in the appearance of men. Who also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? Can you imagine they saw him go up and hear Did I just see what you saw? You know, what they think he was going to parachute back or what, you know? Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come. He's coming again, and he's going to come in like manner as you saw him going to heaven. How did he go into heaven? Bodily. How is he coming back? Bodily. Just like he promised. And indeed, that's exactly what our Lord did. And what did, did he do? He went, and now he's sitting on the right hand of the Father. And by the way, this commission, again, could have practical application in our own lives. As we think of our own Jerusalem, our own Judea, our own Samaria, our own end of the earth, as God wants to use us, where he's planted us, to be a witness of his Christ's death and resurrection. You might ask, well, what is Jesus Christ doing today at the right hand of the Father? And I'm not going to elaborate on any of these, but I'll just in machine gun fashion mention them. Number one, he's preparing a place for believers in Christ. Number two, he's building and directing his church as its head. Number three, he's making intercession for us as our high priest. Number four, he's acting as our defense attorney due to Satan's accusations. Number five, he's enjoying a position of supremacy over Satan and his angels. He's at the command post, as it were, of the universe. Number six, he's seeking to lead and provide victory for yielded slash dependent believers. And number seven, he's producing fruit and abiding believers as the true vine. And probably some more things could be mentioned as well. But what is amazing is if you're a believer today, you not only have a purpose as an ambassador, but you are co-crucified, co-buried, co-risen, co-ascended, co-seated in the heavenlies in Christ, as far as God is concerned. And when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, we shall also appear with him in glory. And you have a great purpose and a great meaning for your life. And thus, believer, faith in God's word is never misplaced faith. One of the things we see in this account today was that believers were told he was going to be rising from the dead and they didn't believe him. Take God at his word and please him. And be willing to grow and be willing to serve right where you are planted and let the Lord lead you as the key to the horizontal is always the vertical. And if you're here today and you've never been saved, Jesus made it very clear, you must be born again. And he said that in John 3, but he did also told you how to be born again in that same chapter. When he said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, whoever believes in him, should not perish, but have everlasting or eternal life. If you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ alone, you never believed he died for you and paid for your sins and rose again, He's offering to you eternal life today. You don't have to ask for it. You don't have to repent from your sins for it. You don't have to walk an aisle. You don't have to pray a prayer. You don't have to ask Jesus in your heart. You don't have to do anything. You simply need to believe in the one who did it all for you, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray.